Oh, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Michael. And um, thank you very much, everyone, for the uh, wonderful talks this morning. Um, very inspiring. And um, I hope that I can uh, sort of add to the picture that we're building up um, and, and perhaps expand it a little bit in, well, in one particular area. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, a chronic disease that we haven't really mentioned very much this morning um, amongst the others, which is osteoporosis. And uh, my, my brief was really to talk about the evidence for, uh, well, nutrition and bone health, what's the evidence? What is the evidence for any effects of nutrition and bone health? And so I'm going to particularly be thinking about um, what's the evidence that acid is bad for bone. And um, Linda uh, introduced us to that a little bit before lunch. And what's the evidence that fruit and vegetables might be good for bone um, within the specific context of osteoporosis? <clears throat> Excuse me. So osteoporosis is a really big problem in this country, as in, uh, in many countries. It affects more than 3 million people a year in the UK. Um, there are about 300,000 fragility fractures um, each year. Uh, predominantly, these are vertebral fractures um, and, uh, and hip fractures, various hip sites. Uh, and that amounts to about one every two minutes, which is a bit scary when you think about it. And obviously the cost is massive to the health service and also in, um, in terms of personal cost and quality of life. As I'm sure everyone here knows, um, it's a metabolic bone disease and it's characterised by bone loss um, and by deterioration of the structure itself of the bone, um, which leads to um, fragile bones which are more likely to break. Why does it happen? Um, well, we spend most of our childhood making bone as we grow and um, there's very rapid uh, bone mineral accumulation and bone mass accumulation right through infancy, um, adolescence and young adulthood. And when we get to about our 20s or 30s, um, we reach the maximum amount of bone that we'll ever get, our peak bone mass. And after that time, it's downhill all the way um, for both men and women. But for women, it's a particular problem because there's this accelerated bone loss at the menopause. And so that's the context that we're going to try and think about this problem of acid base um, and specifically fruit and vegetables. Um, just to show you what it looks like, this is lovely healthy bone of a young 30 year old woman, um, a vertebra, and you can see the, I'm gonna get, you can see the lovely, um, does that actually work? Yeah, the thick interconnecting plates of trabecular bone. Um, the same vertebra, 40 years on, in a 71-year-old woman. Um, and you can see how thin and eroded the bone structure is. And if we look a bit more closely, you can see how the surface of the bone has been eroded, um, almost a breaking point, and eventually perforating. And as that happens throughout the trabeculae of the vertebra, the bone itself is very fragile and fractures. And that's, that's the process um, by which the problems of osteoporosis occur. This is the um, guilty party. This is an osteoclast cell, which is a bone resorbing cell. And the osteoclasts sit on the surface of the bone and they excavate the bone like this um, and form a pit. And that's, that's how the bone is eroded away. But in fact, it's part of a cycle of um, bone modelling. These um, osteoclasts sit on the bone surface, they uh, make a cavity, they erode the bone, and then osteoblasts, which are the bone forming cells, migrate to the bone surface and uh, they make new bone matrix, which is then mineralised and new bone occurs. And this is um, a coupled process. Uh, it's a normal uh, cycle which enables the bone to adapt to things such as mechanical loading, exercise, growth, um, to repair damage. 
to regulate cir circulating calcium levels and, of course, to contribute to acid-base balance, as we shall see. So I've, I've laboured that point a little bit because actually it's important to understand the process if we're going to see um, why acid base is important. And this is just to show you that um, when the osteoclast is breaking down bone, um, various byproducts or, or products of collagen breakdown are uh, produced. And these in particular are ones that we're able to measure to see um, how the process of bone resorption is occurring. Um, and others are secreted by the osteoblasts, which give us um, an idea of bone formation. But I am going to talk about these later on. And these are just breakdown products of collagen as the osteoclasts are resorbing or breaking down the bone. So why this dramatic loss at at menopause? Um, well, as we know, the uh, oestrogen levels at menopause are uh, dramatically um, reduced, and this leads to an uncoupling of that process of bone formation um, and bone resorption. And so that there is more resorption going on than formation, and uh, that's why the bone loses density, becomes thin, and breaks. Now, the problem is that well, almost by definition, this happens after reproductive age, obviously, because it's due to loss of oestrogen. E and so th there's no way that we can evolve and adapt uh, to not have osteoporosis. It, it reminds me a bit of the story we heard earlier of the mouse tails being cut off, or were they rat tails? I can't remember. But children of people who have osteoporosis will get osteoporosis, and there's, there's no way that we can um, evolve to... Um, to, to prevent that and so what can we do? It also begs the question um, what is our skeleton actually for? And of course we all know that skeleton's important structurally and it protects our organs and all the rest of it and was very important as we um, organisms transitioned from marine to land environment um, to give an advantage you know, those, those who had skeletons had a, had a structural advantage um, in terms of mobility and, and various other things. The other thing is that um, when organisms all lived in the sea, there was an abundant calcium supply. There was no need um, to worry about where your next calcium was coming from. In fact, there was probably a need to protect cells from excess calcium, from, from toxicity. And with a transition to um, terrestrial life, um, we then had to, uh, or organisms had to, uh, had to deal with an intermittent calcium supply and uh, still maintain uh, calcium homeostasis within very tight limits. And, um, you know, perhaps that sort of background might explain why in some ways we're quite um, poor um, as, uh, as far as maintaining calcium, calcium levels are concerned. We're not very efficient at absorbing calcium from our diets, for example. Um, and really, essentially, the calcium, uh, the, the skeleton, more than being um, important structurally, which of course it is, is primarily a reservoir. It's a reservoir for calcium, it's a reservoir for base. Um, and so that skeletal integrity is compromised to preserve homeostatic function. And that's really the prime function of the skeleton. And, and um, we need to bear that in mind. So skeletal integrity will always be compromised at the expense of homeostasis. Now, Linda um, explained this very clearly earlier. Um, Acid-base homeostasis is very tightly controlled obviously, um, and between about pH 7.35, 7.45. And we have very efficient buffering systems. Again, as, as uh, Linda said, we have the lungs and the, the kidneys, which uh, either excrete um, carbon dioxide or protons. And we also have plasma protein buffers. But if our acid load increases to such an extent that these buffering systems um, can't cope or are overloaded, um, we end up with metabolic acidosis. And then um, bone resorption may then release mineral um, to raise the pH and um, 
neutralise the acid and calcium is excreted. And as calcium is excreted and mineral is lost, the bone is weakened. So that's, that's the theory. Is there evidence for this? And um, again, we saw this a little bit in Linda's talk. Back to our uh, not very friendly osteoclast. What is the effect of acid on the osteoclast? Um, and this is work um, by Tim Arnett. Um, and this shows you the osteoclasts. These are human osteoclasts which have excavated a, a resorption trail. It looks rather like a horrible kind of slug, but it's actually an excavated trail on the bone um, where the bone's been dug out. But what's more interesting is what's next to it, because um, this shows um, the different pHs that the cells, the osteoclasts, have been cultured in. These are obviously in vitro studies. And at, um, this is pH 7.45, so the top of the upper end of the physiological range, osteoclasts are fairly inactive. But as soon as you start lowering the pH, they become very active. Um, obviously, these are extremely low pHs where they're most active. But look at this. The steepest increase in osteoclast activity occurs here between pH 7.45 and 7.35 which is a very, I mean, it's a tiny decrease and it's within the normal physiological range. And yet we're seeing this massive increase in osteoclast activity, so bone resorption. So acid, or even a very um, mild level of acidosis, can affect osteoclasts and can affect bone resorption. He also looked at the osteoblast cells, and the osteoblast cells are the ones that build bone up. And the opposite effect was seen, so that at low pHs, the osteoblasts are practically inactive. And as pH um, increases, so as um, alkali increases, bone formation, so making new bone, um, increases. And again, this steepest rise is just here at the sort of upper middle end of the normal range of pH. And so raising the pH by just a little bit, so increasing base by just a little bit, can have this dramatic effect on forming new bone. And what about uh, in people as opposed to in vitro studies? And they're just, I, I haven't put all the studies up here, but they're just um, one or two um, studies which show that as we, um, if we look at the association between dietary acid load, which uh, may be all flawed now <laughs> after this morning's talk, but anyway, um, looking at estimates of dietary acid load, there's, um, we do see an association with bone measures, and this is looking at um, ultrasound measures of bone mass in these two studies by um, Alsa Welsh and um, Emma Wynne. Not all studies um, show the same results, and these are two um, with negative results, um, where Tanis Fenton um, showed that actually acid excretion did not um, predict bone loss. And this study published last year by um, Garcia et al, looking at children. And actually, they measured um, diet. They measured um, acid load at aged one, um, and then bone, um, bone mineral density by DEXA, it was at age six, and looked for an association there and didn't find one. Um, my feeling is actually the situation in children is probably quite different, who are growing that very rapidly, and we maybe need to look at uh, slightly different measures or more accurate measures. Um, and so what about uh, diet overall and bone, and particularly fruit and vegetables and bone? Which we'll come to. So we're used to thinking about things like calcium, um, I'm afraid I'm not actually going to talk about calcium. I was, but I, I won't have enough time, so I'm not going to talk about calcium today. But that's, that's very much, um, you know, in, in the public arena. Um, there are 
uh, now mixed mixed feelings about um, calcium and calcium supplementation and dairy. My feeling is that some of those conflicting results um, are really to do perhaps with associations with vitamin D status and acid base status as much as calcium levels per se. Vitamin D we've heard all about Thank you to Sue this morning. Um, and we know that many other micronutrients such as vitamin K and magnesium are important for bone. But what about fruit and vegetables? Well, fruit and vegetables are obviously complex foods. They're not a, a supplement or a nutrient. They contain many different vitamins. They contain a number of different minerals. They contain um, flavonoids, phenolic acids, and organic acids um, such as citrate and malate, and, and, and any number of, of other components, and in different proportions, obviously, depending on which fruit and vegetables we're talking about. Um, so we'll just look at one or two studies that showed associations of um, intakes of fruit and vegetables or markers for fruit and vegetable intake such as potassium um, and bone measures. So uh, quite a long time ago now um, Tucker looked at the Framingham cohort which if you're not familiar with it is a, a very large cohort um, that's been followed right from I think the 1940s a, a very um, rich resource there and um, they looked at older men and women who were around 75 years old at the time of the baseline um, measures. And they looked at uh, their diets, how much fruit and vegetables they ate, um, and their potassium intakes, amongst other things, and also measured bone mineral density. And they showed that for each um, additional portion of fruit and vegetables eaten per day, I think it was fruit, yes, fruit and vegetables eaten per day, um, there was a 1% greater um, bone mineral. They, the, those who ate, uh, a, sorry, for every portion of fruit, I'll say it right in a minute, every portion of fruit and vegetables led to a 1% greater um, bone mineral density. And for every gram of potassium intake, there was a 3 to 5% greater bone mineral density in both men and women. And when you think that um, bone loss around the menopause can be at its fastest, sort of 2 to 5%, um, that, that is really quite an important effect that a simple uh, dietary measure can have. They also looked longitudinally, so they measured diet at baseline and then um, and bone mineral density, and then bone mineral density again four years later and looked at the change in um, BMD. And um, in men only this time, they showed that both higher fruit and vegetable intakes and higher potassium intakes were associated with less bone loss. Remember that these were uh, all 75 to by then 79 year olds so they were all losing bone but the fruit and veg and potassium were associated with less bone loss and then um, Sue Lanham New in um, in Aberdeen screen at that time <laughs> um, looked at women uh, younger women premenopausal women um, was that this making the noise Premenopausal women um, in the Aberdeen Osteoporosis Screening Program, and they also saw that um, women with the lowest intakes of fruit in the past had the lowest BMD, and those with the lowest potassium intakes, current potassium intakes, also had low BMD, and then that shows potassium intakes um, by quartiles and lumbar spine BMD. So those with the lowest potassium intake had the lowest bone mineral density and the highest potassium, highest bone mineral density. And interestingly, they also showed that the potassium intakes were associated with bone resorption. And this is pyridinoline, which is one of the markers of resorption. And so those with the highest, uh, sorry, the highest um, potassium intakes had the lowest bone loss and those with the lowest potassium intakes had the highest bone loss. And this is just um, the same marker looking at the correlation with potassium intake. So these are um, observational studies. Oh, sorry, this is actually um, 
also from Aberdeen, Helen MacDonald, um, who looked not just at potassium, but also the potential um, renal acid load, so an indication of um, dietary acid load and um, acid excretion, and showed here a clear relationship with this same bone resorption marker, so that if you had, uh, if you were, had more acid, you had more bone resorption and less potassium, more bone resorption. And then in um, 1997, the DASH trial um, was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And um, again, this has been mentioned earlier, the DASH diet um, was, this, this intervention trial um, was actually to prevent hypertension. And the diet was characterised by high intakes of fruit and vegetables and a sort of moderate intake of uh, low-fat dairy products and I think was quite successful in reducing um, blood pressure. But um, interestingly for us today, it also was associated with lower bone turnover. And here these um, are two different bone turnover, turnover markers. This at the bottom here is CTX, a resorption marker, which um, was markedly decreased over the time of the intervention with um, the DASH diet. So that's controls at the top and the DASH diet at the bottom. So obviously that's not a single food or a single nutrient because it was a, a dietary pattern intervention but still quite interesting. And um, if we look back 30 years, um, this uh, was written in The Lancet when um, Vatman and Bernstein uh, published some of their early work with acid and bone. And they said it might be worthwhile to consider decreasing the rate of bone attrition by the use of a diet favouring alkaline ash. This type of diet would emphasise fruit and vegetables, vegetable protein and moderate amounts of milk. And that was um, more than 30 years ago now. And um, this is just a list of foods with the different potential um, acid load that they might contribute. And we can see that fruit and vegetables are right at the top of the, um, of the alkaline end. Sorry, I've got that the wrong way around. <laughs> um, and uh, these are the neutral foods and these are the acid generating foods. And so, well, fruit and vegetables, as we've said before, contain um, high levels of citrate and malate, which are metabolised um, as bicarbonate in the body. And they are generally, not always, but usually associated with potassium in fruit and vegetables. And so we decided to try and look at intervention studies where a supplement of either potassium citrate or potassium bicarbonate um, was given because it's a lot easier to look at a single supplement um, than to look at a general fruit and um, vegetable intervention and it can be quantified and controlled and everything else. And so um, we uh, did a meta-analysis um, of the effects of supplementation with alkaline potassium salts on bone metabolism, looking at um, randomised controlled trials. And of course, um, Linda's expertise um, was greatly used on the paper and um, Sue as well, and these other colleagues too. Um, and it was published last year in Osteoporosis International. <laughs> what, do you think it's this? Slide, I'll just leave that. I don't need to point. Um, <laughs> sorry. I just think that a window needs to be clicked. Like, if you could escape. This one, escape. Yeah. So just see if there's anything popping up. Is there something like it pop up or something? It's just, it might be that, actually. I don't see anything we've it's got up like there. USB, yeah. It sounds like a USB plug that is slightly blocking. I think it's that. Thank you. That's the stick that it's off. Will it still work? Oh, that's that's my stick. Yeah. Anyway. Is it really annoying, or should I just carry on? 
Just turn yeah. Oh, I don't mind. Carry on. Carry on. Oh, yeah, just mute it. Where's the mute? Yeah, just mute it. Yeah. Where's the Where's mute? The mute? Does anybody mute. know where the mute is? Yeah. Is there a mute on the dashboard there? I think in front of you. Yeah, project yourself. Is there like a mute? Oh, there it is. Yeah. Just turn that off. There. Yeah. yeah oh, so that technical. Okay, that was that'll be all right. You just need I'll just find yeah, I'll go down. Sorry about that. Okay. Mm Good. So um, our our main effects that we're looking for in the matter analysis were. Um, urinary calcium excretion, uh, urinary acid excretion, markers of bone turnover and bone min mineral density as main outcomes. And we hypothesised that the supplements would decrease uh, calcium and acid excretion because that's what we've seen um, before, decrease bone turnover markers and increase bone mineral density. And uh, we managed to identify 14 studies that um, were eligible to be included. Uh, others were excluded because they just weren't randomised or weren't controlled or whatever. And as it happened, seven of the 14 were potassium uh, carbonate uh, supplementation studies and seven were potassium citrate. And seven were randomised controlled trials of about four weeks to three years and seven were crossover studies um, of less than four weeks duration. And the doses ranged from about 30 to 120 millimoles per day of, of supplement. So as we uh, expected when we looked at all the studies together um, and looked at urinary calcium excretion, there was a clear effect of both potassium citrate and bicarbonate um, on calcium excretion. Uh, it, they reduced the calcium excretion, and that was true when we looked separately at the carbonate and the citrate. So they were conserving calcium. The, the supplements, the alkali supplements, were conserving calcium, but obviously we can't say from this whether we were preserving bone or whether there's another mechanism, um, for example, via uh, absorption uh, for preserving bone. But we, reduced cal we saw reduced calcium excretion and we saw reduced acid excretion. Again, um, we would imagine that we were giving base and there would be less acid excreted by the kidneys. And again, that was true for both potassium bicarbonate supplements and potassium citrate supplements. So, so far um, as expected, what about uh, bone turnover? Because if bone turnover um, was reduced, then we might be able to assume that the reduction in calcium excretion was actually due to bone being conserved. And in fact, when we looked at NTX, which is one of the breakdown products of collagen, so it's a bone, turn uh, bone resorption marker, we did in fact see that there was a change in um, NTX excretion and um, it was it was reduced so bone was being preserved when we looked at the formation markers we didn't really see anything um, and that could be for a number of reasons uh, bone formation tends to respond after um, resorption and so one might not see anything but also um, there was quite a lot of heterogeneity in the studies and they di all looked at different formation markers so we couldn't uh, there weren't enough studies look, looking at the same formation markers to be able to pull them together um, and get a meaningful result. So that's probably the reason why there wasn't really an effect on formation markers. And our fourth outcome that we wanted to look at was bone mineral density, because at the end of the day, that's the thing that we really want to um, affect uh, if we're going to prevent osteoporosis. Um, but we actually we only had two studies that had bone mineral density as a as an endpoint and one showed a clear positive effect and one didn't um, which was surprising they were actually quite similar studies similar duration similar supplement um, and so we couldn't conclude 
that um, the supplements had an effect on bone mineral density. Um, that will have to be for further trials. And so to summarise the meta-analysis, um, short or long-term supplementation with potassium carb bicarbonate or potassium citrate um, both reduced calcium loss and reduced acid excretion. Um, and we presume by increasing circulating um, bicarbonate and reducing protons and reduced bone resorption and so did contribute to preserving bone. And so perhaps um, an increased fruit and vegetable intake might be a means of attenuating um, age-related bone loss. How much do we need to take? Do we need to be eating a whole shop full of fruit and vegetables to have any effect on our bones? Um, I was much misquoted following uh, an interview on Radio 4 Women's Hour as having said that we had to eat nine bananas a day, which actually wasn't what I'd said, but clearly it latched onto somebody's imagination. Um, the levels of supplement in the studies that we looked at in the meta-analysis were equivalent to about five to eight portions of fruit and vegetable a day. And in the UK, the current sort of recommendations for fruit and veg intake is five a day. And so it's not too unrealistic in the context of our current re recommendations um, to think about uh, increasing fruit and vegetable intake to that sort of level. And just to compare, in the DASH diet, um, they were taking eight to 10 portions um, per day, so um, considerably more, but perhaps none of it completely unrealistic, um, especially if we're replacing all our cereal-based carbs with fruit and vegetables. So what really needs to happen next? Well, ideally, um, a DASH-style dietary intervention with bone endpoints would be ideal because um, obviously the original DASH diet um, was, was a hypertension outcome. Um, a multi-centre paleo diet intervention um, <laughs> would also be good. And then looking at some of the other things that are in um, fruit and vegetable, flavonoids, um, magnesium, um, as I said, fruit and vegetables are complex, but clearly do have this beneficial effect on our bones. And um, it would be good to try and just tease out a bit more of what's going on. And I think that's it. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Helen, for a really lovely, beautifully organised talk and keeping to time despite the time. I'm not sure what time I was meant to finish, actually. Is that right? I was, have you sorry, I'm bit, yes, I think you, so. Yeah. Shall we have uh, any questions? questions? Anybody want to question? Yes, a question. Uh, yes what, would, what would you say would be significance of, say, bone broth in terms of bone health? Um, I'm not overly up to date with bone broth, but I, I understand it's really mostly got amino acids and protein in it, hasn't it? Yes. Isn't that its main benefit? Well, I think as um, Linda said, protein is essential for bone, but needs to be taken in conjunction with the uh, higher fruit and vegetable intake to compensate for the increased acid lo load of the protein, I would say, but I'm sure it's a good thing. Do you mean out of the potassium? The the um, similar, similar. Mm. I don't know if you do. You have any comments on which would is better out of citrate and bicarbonate, Linda? I suspect it's a just dependent thing, as in yeah. like milli equivalents per kilogram body weight. Um, so, you know, when you, most of the studies in women, the women tend to be between sixty and seventy kilos. If you do studies in men who are eighty to ninety kilos, relatively they're getting a lower dose. Mm. So um, I think you have to take weight into um, yeah. account. Yeah. Is physical physical activity ever taken into account uh, with any of these studies in relation to 
Um, well, I should be. <laughs> um, I think in the metabolic studies, obviously, they were in controlled um, environments. Um, I'm afraid I can't quite remember the details of the longer-term sure studies. They all controlled for physical activity. I mean, every bone study that I've ever seen has controlled for physical activity because it has such an important effect on bone density. Oh, yeah. What they did was they told, it was a two-year two year study, they yeah. told the women to maintain their usual level of yeah. activity, whatever that was. So mm -hmm. in as much as that was controlled. Yeah. That was the study where they did see an increase in BMD. Um, are there countries with low acid diets that correlate with lower incidence of Probably, but there are quite a lot of other factors in those countries which might also affect osteoporosis, such as vitamin D status and physical activity. Um, I'm thinking, for example, in the Gambia, where um, a lot of studies have been done and where for calcium intakes are low, but bone density is actually quite high. Um, but you know, vitamin D status is probably high, physical activity is high. There, there are a lot of Confounders, so I I couldn't honestly answer, uh, you know, that question in a in a straight way. Um, so calcium homeostasis is often disrupted in like patients with Alzheimer's disease. Is it like have has anyone looked at like bone mineral density in relation to? I don't know actually. That's really interesting. I don't know. Do, do you know? Oh. No. <laughs> How, well, how the great are all screwed up anyway. <laughs> That's true, but um, but often, yeah, you have a disruption, and I'm just wondering if it has anything to do with maybe they have a lower bone mineral density. They might, yeah. Mind they you, they've probably that? got low bone mineral density anyway, don't they? Given the age of people true, with Alzheimer's true. and uh, their activity levels and stuff. So how how useful is like urinary excretion as a marker of um, bone? Well, for so calcium, calcium status. not very, right. I don't think, really, um, because, well, it's a useful indication that, of calcium being lost, but because, you know, 99% of your body calcium is in the skeleton and the serum levels are so tightly controlled that it's quite difficult to have a, like a marker of calcium status, I would say. Can I ask you a, uh, mm. a question? A bit, a bit aside from what you've been talking about, but I'm intrigued by the fact that if you, the marine mammals, for, for, well, put it this way, for 50 million years, there was a progressive migration from, of land-based ma mammals into the Back sea. Back to the sea, yeah. And they were either looked like us or chimpanzees or something, or, or cows or something yeah. of that nature, but these were animals walking on land with obviously yeah. healthy bones. Now, if you look at that picture of the dolphin that I showed, I showed the picture of the dolphin's flipper, inside which are all the hands, yeah. all the bones mm -hmm. of the human hand mm -hmm. and arm. Yeah. And as a fetus, it has vestigial legs. Okay. Now, it, 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 if that started off as a four-legged animal with full bones, mm. it's quite clear that during its evolution into the sea, becoming permanently involved in the sea, there must have been a lot of bone resorption. Mm. Now, can you explain that on the basis of what the dolphin might have been eating? No. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mean in the sea or on before it sea. got back in to the, the sea? sea. No, it went into the sea. Yeah. Um, because it, it, it's universal without all the yeah. throughout all the marine mammals that, that they they have you witness a resorption of yeah. bone and the, yeah. replaced by you know the the, the hand. Is, is just covered in skin. It Has it actually been resorbed, or have they just evolved so that in each generation they've got well, slightly have, less developed done, hind limbs? It's not actually resorbed, though. Oh, I don't know. I don't As know. in I, I, the creature itself I, I, isn't resorbing. Trying I imagine that in that process, we're talking about an evolutionary process yeah. where those with perhaps less effective, whatever they were, I'm not, I don't know much about evolution, effective hind flippers yeah. ended up in the sea 
and those with the more effective ones stayed on the land, but they wouldn't have actually been resorbing it at the time, would they? I think we have some kind of chemical explanation for this. Okay. This, this happening to in, engender an epigenetic change yeah. from generation to generation. And so I guess what you were saying what, earlier what about the environment. You yeah. went through very quickly, had plus nine on it. Oh, yes. What did that mean? So that meant that if you eat a lot of fish and not a lot of fruit and vegetables, you'll end up with acidosis. But if you eat a lot Does of... Does that mean you're going to end up with fur or bones? Potentially. There, you've answered my question. Thank you. Oh, good. <laughs>